Okay, where we want the OpenEdX frontend to go. Before we get there, let's remind ourselves why we chose MFEs in the first place. Now, for many of us, this was a, MFEs were a surprise, right? Around 2019, we started hearing noises. Ooh, frontend, micro frontend, what's going on? Um, and by 2020, I think it was COA, we actually got some MFEs to play around with. And uh, if you're around, you would have been surprised at some of the decisions, but more, more on that later. Uh, let's first discuss why this was done and the advantages that we got. Um, that's a ball of mud, <laughs> if you couldn't tell. Uh, BOM is uh, OpenEdX's uh, affectionate nickname for, you know, all the code in the platform, basically, right? So imagine, imagine you're trying to make a ball out of mud, okay? Uh, can you think of some challenges in doing that, right? It depends on the consistency of the mud, if it's dry, if it's not. Uh, regardless, imagine you have a ball of mud on your hands and you want to make changes to this ball of mud, say add some mud or remove some mud. Uh, the difficulty is in making it still be a ball, right? Because mud tends to, you know, uh, slide around and, and do things you, you wouldn't expect it to do or wouldn't want it to do. So keep this analogy in mind if, you, if you'll permit me. Um, we had a few problems with the code base at around 2017. Um, first off, if you remember, you all know what Django is, right? Django is a platform, a, a framework, a Python framework, which was chosen uh, for the project when it started. And Django's great, don't get me wrong, but the way it does front-end code is basically when a request comes in, Django will render the HTML, process the data, render the HTML, and serve it to the browser, right? That's the, you could say, the usual way of doing things. But when you get to edX.org scale, uh, think about thousands of simultaneous requests, hundreds of thousands. Uh, all of these, even no matter how well you cache your stuff, it's still going to hit the, the rendering pipeline at some point, right? Uh, so you call this basically a bottleneck. Another problem, you, whenever you made a single simple change to, let's say, a single string in the platform, you wanted to put it up into production, you basically have to package the whole application and then deploy it. You can't just upload a single .html page the way Django works, right? So it makes deployment risky and also pretty clunky. Finally, the main problem that we were facing was it was just plain slow to develop. You, when you're faced with, anybody here ever tried to change code in Studio? Right, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you used to call PHP a flying spaghetti monster of code, right? And that was worse than, than Studio. But Studio, the way it is now, is not much better than that, right? Uh, you have some interesting things going on, such as uh, Django rendering a view that then loads underscore templates. And yeah, it's a big ball of mud. Okay. So this is where we were in 2017. MFEs to the rescue. Yay, this is going to solve everything, right? Uh, some of it, yeah, sure. Um, but before, before I get into how they help us, what are MFEs? When did they come about? So 2016. November 2016, uh, Thoughtwork, the ThoughtWorks Tech Radar. Have, you, have any of you uh, heard of what this is? Okay, a few of you. Thought, ThoughtWorks is a company, and every six months they put out a tech radar. It's just their point of view of what's cool and what's not cool in the tech industry at that point. Okay, so 2016, November, micro frontends were, oh, look. That looks cool. Let's see what they do. By 2020, they were firmly in, they're awesome. If you're starting a project, make sure to use micro frontends. Um, if you're on an old project, try and migrate to micro frontends. Okay, so 
within a four year time span, oh, and by the way, this was the last time micro front ends showed up in the tech radar, which means that it sort of became mainstream afterwards. Since 2020, micro front ends sort of, if you're doing anything in the front end and you're not using micro front ends, it better be something cooler than them, right? <laughs> so, micro front ends, it's the, you could call it mainstream, uh, basically, so use them. What did we actually get out of them uh, in terms of open edX, uh, I'm talking about now? We no longer had the server rendering bottleneck I was just discussing. Why? Because front end, micro front ends, they're loaded by the browser. Uh, the JavaScript and HTML and assets are loaded by the browser before any requests to the server are made. Right? Of course, you think, well, but loading the JavaScript is a request. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> It, it can be to S3, to a st anything that serves uh, static files. So you don't have to worry about uh, caching. You can put it on Cloudflare. It doesn't matter, right? So it's no longer your problem. Uh, the rendering is basically no longer your problem. It's the user's browser's problem. Okay, so you're offloading CPU cycles onto the user's browser and bandwidth onto wherever you want to put it. Uh, the great thing about MFEs is because they're independent, you can uh, deploy them at any time independently from the rest of your code base. So uh, to, keep, to stick to OpenEdX, if now you want to change a string or something in, your, uh, in the account menu of a user's account menu, you just deploy the account MFE, nothing else. So it's basically isolated from all the rest. Um, you can have you can have a deployment that's free of risk and it's quick. One excellent thing that we got was incremental upgrades, not of the MFEs themselves, but of the technology inside the, the MFEs. So this is something Adam's uh, very familiar with. Uh, Adam's in the uh, enterprise team at 2U, and I'm, I'm always looking to Adam for what's coming next because what he's able to do now, and we couldn't do before, was to play around, quote unquote, with new technologies without putting the rest of the code base either at risk or without having the bureaucracy of having to, a certain piece of technology have to work with all of the features in the platform. So Adam can go and play around, you know, let's, let me get rid of Redux. I don't like Redux anymore. Uh, so for this new enterprise MFE, I'm not gonna use Redux. Um, and the only reason, for instance, I know about it is because I asked him. <laughs> uh, we don't, uh, uh, there's no need, there are no choke points between parts of the uh, MFE code base. Right? They're pretty much independent. Finally, and this is implicit in what I was just talking about, teams that work on MFEs are autonomous, uh, almost completely. As long as they conform to the APIs that exist in the backend, they can do pretty much whatever they want with their own micro front end. Okay, so these are essentially the wins that we got by, well, by now, 2022. We still have these wins. Uh, and we got things such as the new discussions MFE, the front end app learning, and the cool new authentication uh, MFE. Right? It's the one that looks coolest, which is why I put it up there. Um, whether it's, uh, there are some problems with it, we'll talk about them later. <laughs> yeah, there's always a but, right? Uh, so we got all of this cool stuff, but what's, what's the problem? Um, so I lied, MFEs did make a new showing uh, six months after that last one uh, in the tech creator. So you see the little red dot is in the, it says hold there on the last uh, radar thing. And I'm going to quote them here. Um, MFE anarchy is the tendency to use this architecture as an excuse to mix a range of competing technologies, tools, or frameworks in a single page, leading to you know, a big mess. <laughs> so I'm not saying we're doing this exactly, but keep this in mind. Okay? This is the fact that it's in the hold uh, section of the radar means be careful about that. It doesn't mean that micro front ends are bad. Just keep in mind you don't want a mess, right? Nobody likes a mess. Uh, 
And this is industry-wide. This is not open ethics. This is something that uh, ThoughtWorks noted happening in the wild. Keep that in mind. A little bit about the way we do micro frontends in open ethics right now. Basically, they're completely independent. What does that mean? From the user's point of view, it means that each page or each new MFE is a page reload. Okay, so nowadays, if you're, on the, in the, you're a learner and you click on the menu and, and select account, you're taken to a different URL. There's a full page reload, you know, like the good old days. This is the, the way pages happened in the good old days, right? But we've, we've learned uh, to do it a little bit more efficiently nowadays. But anyway, the fact that in open edX, the MFEs are independent, it means that when you change to another one, you get a full page reload. There's no interaction between MFEs. You can't make a request or pass data in from one MFE into another, except by URL parameter or cookie or something like that. But that's not th something that actually happens in practice, as far as I know. Um, we have shared components and libraries. This is what Paragon is all about. Uh, this is what uh, React is all about. So all of our MFEs, as far as I know, use Paragon, React, Redux. Uh, some of them use the branding package, some don't. We'll get into more, more on that later. But we do share libraries and components. And this is a good thing. But otherwise, there's complete development freedom for each MFE. Each team gets to make their own decisions. They get their own ADRs. Uh, I have an MFE uh, that uh, just issued the authentication MFE, if I'm not mistaken, just issued an ADR that they don't want to use, um, that they want to use Redux uh, RTK query, for example, which is pretty cool. But it's going to be the only one, basically, that's using it outside from the, our tutorial example uh, <laughs> earlier in the week for those that were there. That were there. So complete, complete independence. They can do, uh, a, a team that owns an MFE can do whatever they want. But this brings a new set of problems. Um, UX inconsistencies. You have some MFEs that render the header component different from other MFEs. So it's kind of jarring as a user if you go from one to another. First you get a full page reload, and then you get a different look you might be confused and say, well, is this a new website? What am I looking at here, right? Uh, I'm gonna show you how, what that looks like soon enough. We've had a regression in customizability. Now, this is not all the, uh, the way we do MFEs. Uh, it's not a problem with the way we do MFEs now. It's more a, we used to be too loose about this. With Django and Mako templates, it was possible to change anything in a web page. Anything, anything. You could do whatever you want. Uh, all of this without forking the code. So you, could, you, you used comprehensive theming or abused it to you know, uh, build a full, complete, different experience that you wouldn't be able to tell was open edX if you didn't know, right? So some of this happened in the community. And this is not necessarily a good thing. But the fact is, people were used to this freedom, and we took it away from them with MFEs. Right? Uh, there's no server-side rendering. There's no Mako templates. You can't tell the user's browser to substitute a piece of HTML for another. It's already in the browser. Right? If it's not a foreseen change in the JavaScript co code to begin with, you can't make the server change something in the front end. Developing is actually harder if you think about it in some ways now. Uh, not least of which, I'm going to skip ahead one, uh, we didn't finish actually moving from the old way, from Mako templates and Django into just MFEs. We now have the old way and each MFE's way. So now, instead of just having one way to theme things and customize things, we have like a series of ways in, in practice because each MFE is not created the same unfortunately. Uh, so developing is harder because you need to keep in your brain each developer because, uh, let's face it, it's not all organizations that use open edX that have tens or dozens or hundreds of developers to work with. So it's pretty common that a single developer will have to worry about theming each MFE 
and the, and the old stuff, right? So for them, it's harder now because they have to learn new ways to do things, multiple new ways to do things, where before it was just one. It's not all bad, though. Uh, it's actually easier to change a single MFE than it ever was to change a single anything in the ball of mud. So it's not all bad. <laughs> but it's, it doesn't mean it's, it's, it's as easy as it could be. OK, so yeah. Show, not tell, I've been told. So um, this, is the, uh, this is a master dev stack. Okay? This is the latest code as of, I don't know, yesterday morning. Um, when you list courses in the default experience, this is what you see. Okay? This is, these are the possible courses. I'm logged in as the audit user, which is one of the default users. Uh, and then I click on the demonstration course. And now this is what I see. Now look at the header there, right? There's a help menu and there's an audit user. They're still there. It's like, okay, something's different, right? And let's say I then click on audit and select the account menu. Okay, all right. It looks sort of like the same thing. Not exactly. <laughs> So um, this is what I meant about UX and consistencies. And if you go to edX.org, you don't see this stuff. And the reason is because they theme their stuff heavily. And uh, the, the people that do the theming and the CSS styles, whatever, they actually worry about this stuff, so, um, which is great. But this means that all of you operators here, people that deploy OpenX, you have to worry about that too. You don't get it for free. You have to go and change styles and theming and whatnot so you get the exact same experience, right? Because the menu items are there, maybe not the help button there, but you get my drift, right? Um, if, if I'm honest, this is this inconsistency and the fact it's not as easy to theme is probably the biggest complaint the, the community is voicing right now which is why I have these dedicated slides for it. Um, all right, so finally, let's get to what we're proposing to do about it. Um, a compromise, basically, no surprise, right? On the one hand, we have, uh, I'm calling that modularity, but it's more like complete independence, okay? On the other, we have the monolith, which is what we had before where every developer hands are tied to a particular uh, set of requirements, right? So in here, I'm free, I can do whatever I want. Here, I'm in a straight jacket. I have to stick to the pattern, and it's very difficult to move forward. You know, you got the idea. So we're gonna have to come to an agreement as to what is a compromise in this case. And that's what we set forth to do. Uh, can you tell this is AI generated? <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> this is not actually a, a real turtle. Um, <laughs> poor thing. Anyway, <laughs> it's supposed to convey the idea that you have two things living under a single thing, OK? So uh, the MFEs are the turtles inside. And the, uh, the shell, the application shell, or the domain, which is the, what the title of the talk is referring about, uh, is talking about, right? So, all right, what, are, what am I talking about here? Uh, the shell is going to be the container application. Okay? Um, by the way, this is straight from Martin Fowler's website. Uh, and this was written years ago. It's not like last year or something. This was almost from the beginning. Um, so the idea is you have a container application and you have the two turtles there. Uh, let's say a browse micro front end and an order micro front end. So what happens is you hit slash, you hit the root of, the, of your application. Um, the container application knows that if you hit root, it's gonna render, it's gonna fetch your uh, browse MFE from somewhere, send it to the browser, it'll be rendered, and the browser will then hit the server as necessary. And if in doing that, the user clicks on a buy button, 
the container application will know to fetch the, the buy or the order micro front end from somewhere else, send it to the browser, it'll be rendered, and then it will talk to the server accordingly. Okay? Uh, key here, the key here is that they're all under the same roof. Uh, and the routing is done by the container application. This is, it's actually really simple. This is the proposal. If you understand this, you understand what's coming next. Okay? I'm going to get into a little bit of coding detail, not much, uh, just so the folks here that do develop and know what I'm talking about. But this is the idea. Uh, another way to look at it is via this quadrant, where either you can have an application shell or not, whether you share libraries between MFEs or not. Right? Of course, if you don't share libraries and you don't have an application shell, you have different websites. You know, what, what's the point? Which is why the bottom left is empty there. Um, if you have an application shell, but you do not share libraries, well, you're, then you're just sharing CSS and some layout. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So basically what I'm saying is you should always share libraries and components in your application however many MFEs you have. You just have a choice between having an application shell or not. And this is not my term, the modulith. Uh, I came across it in, in researching this topic, and I loved it, which means you, you, you're going somewhere between the monolith and full modularity. Right? So this is, this is me not being completely tied. I can do some stuff, not everything I want. I'm still free. But you know, uh, think of it like a social contract, for example. So the modulith. How does it work? Well, it routes between apps. I already showed you how, how that's supposed to work. Um, this is an important one. What happens now with us, with our MFEs? Uh, some of our MFEs have React version, uh, I don't know, 16 dot, 17 dot, whatever. Uh, other MFEs have React version X, Y, and Z. So whenever you change from one MFE to another, remember, I click the account button, a full page refresh. I have to load a separate version of React, separate version of X, Y, and Z, and that's just, that's just wasteful. There's just bandwidth being used for no significant gain from the point of view of the user. From the point of view of the developer, it's great because, you know, Adam's like, I don't care. I, I want to use React version 45 in my new MFE. But, uh, and Adam, of course, knows this. By the way, a lot of this is his idea. So <laughs> I'm picking on him because, uh, you know, I, he knows that what's, what's up, right? So anyway, <laughs> uh, it's great for the developers, not so great for the end user. And whenever we have to put those on the balance, uh, it's good practice to favor the user versus the developer. Of course, there's a middle ground there, right, which is what we're striving for. But if we can at all favor the end user, let's do that, right? Um, if you have an application shell, you hopefully can ensure standards across your apps. Because basically, if you're living under the same roof in a house, right, there are house rules. Uh, you know, you can't make, you can't have a party after 10.30 on weekdays. Uh, you can't uh, come in with dirty shoes and so on and so forth. So that's the same thing, the same concept here. You're going to establish some house rules for MFEs. And the, and the price you're going to pay, of course, is that there's going to be some cross dependencies across the MFEs, right? You're going to lose a little bit of freedom. How will this help? Well, let's say you, um, one of the contracts between MFEs is that MFEs no longer know about the header, for example. Uh, the header is now no longer their concern. It is a contract that the shell application has with the MFE. So, I'm going to render the header for you. You don't need to worry about the header anymore. Uh, if you want to put something on the header that's not there by default, 
you can tell me, but I'm doing the rendering. You're not doing the rendering, okay? Um, so this is just an example. There are many other nuances to this, but the, the point is uh, you reduce, potentially reduce inconsistencies via these contracts. Um, if you don't have to worry about the header, it's easier, right? You only have to worry about the stuff that your MF feed does. You don't need to know uh, how to import the header. You don't need to worry about the version the header is in versus the other MFE's versions, right? Uh, you only have to worry about your own MFE's concerns. So that makes it easier to develop. And this is an opportunity, if you're doing this, which is what we're proposing here, migrating MFE's into this architecture. Uh, you have the opportunity to standardize on customization. Now, if you, uh, have, you, have you been, did you guys go to David Joy's talk on customization? How many of you? Just like, okay, how many? All right. <laughs> David, watch the, the stream later, the video. Uh, David went into a lot more detail into how we can improve customizability going forward. There are many things we can do. My, I'm going to stick to saying that if we have an application shell, it's going to be easier to do that, whatever. Whatever option we choose to customize our MFEs, uh, leaving holes in the page, uh, having new plugin services, whatever, if you have a, some standardization across MFEs, it's going to be much easier. And well, finally, from my point of view, this is the main advantage. Uh, I'm proposing something new. I'm proposing a re-replatforming. Right? So we didn't finish the first one. So I want to introduce a new version, but this is an opportunity to actually finish it, right? Uh, while at the same time solving the problems that the first one didn't solve. I know, I know, uh, I was rolling, I know. <laughs> I've, I've, I'm aware of how this sounds, uh, but there's, there's a difference and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it later, you'll see. All right, what are the shells? we're talking about here. First off, the LMS, okay? The LMS is gonna be the first shell. All the MFEs that Tutor supports, right? Well, not all of them. Most of them are LMS uh, type MFEs. So those are going to go into the LMS uh, domain. Studio is another, and Enterprise is another. Are these gonna be completely separate? Like the MFEs that work on the LMS don't work in Studio and whatnot? Actually, no. The idea is that uh, the MFEs that you create primarily for the MFE can also work, for example, in the enterprise domain. But there might be differences. The, uh, for example, uh, the learning MFE, it has to conform to a certain contract say, with the uh, LMS shell application. But Enterprise extends that contract a little bit. The interface is larger. Um, uh, the trick is you just make the MFE understand both, right? Because there's going to be a lot of overlap. And you can then use an MFE in Enterprise and in the LMS shell, right? So there are going to be similarities between these uh, domains. But remember, we can't give up developer freedom completely because then we're back to the monolith. So while each of these shells are gonna have different expectations, different contracts, there are gonna be MFEs that are expected to work on one or more of them, right? And these are just the first set of domains we can envision. There might be more later, maybe an analytics domain, I don't know. Um, Okay, so before going on, the important thing to note here is that each, each of these might have different uh, expected versions of React, for example, or versions of Paragon. Uh, there might be different from the other uh, domain, just so keep that in mind. Okay, so as to how, the actual dirty details of how to do this, there are many options around um, without you having to reinvent the wheel which we certainly do not want to do at this point. Uh, so we're not rolling our own. Um, we considered web components. 
uh, and Webpack module federation as solutions to this. And they're cool, they're really cool. Actually, um, module federation is what started this whole conversation, right? Adam suggested it a few months ago. Um, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. It's just a piece of the puzzle. And while you know, we can build our own uh, puzzle, I felt or we felt that if we had more guidance, it would be better, right? Which is where when we arrived at Single Spa. Um, and Single Spa is pretty much a framework, but it's, uh, it's a little too loose as compared to what we eventually chose, and that was Pyro, right? Um, and the reason we're choosing Pyro is so we don't fall into the trap of uh, rebuilding everything from scratch that already exists. And, you know, remember Django? Django is full of opinions. Um, it doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but it sort of leads you by the hand. We wanted to choose something for the front end that did something similar, right? And this is Pyro. So, I don't have a lot of time to go into the dirty details, but think of, does this have a laser thing? Oh, it does. Think of that container shell as basically all of this except the pilots at the top. Okay, so this is the whole of the container uh, shell here. And it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, you can see that Pyro loads React because Pyro is React-based, which is great because RMFEs are all React-based. Uh, but the essence of it is this is the framework. There's Pyro Core, which you can think of as the Linux kernel of the thing. And there are plugins, which you can think of as kernel drivers, maybe. The point being, uh, you only need to worry about this stuff by the point you need to extend the framework, okay? In the beginning, it leads you by the hand as to what you're supposed to do regarding all the things we talked about until now. Um, and pilots or our MFEs. Now, I'm not a big fan of the name, <laughs> pilot, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that it'll give us a nice little yellow brick road or golden brick road to follow so we achieve the goals that we set uh, out to do before. A um, little more on Pyro. It's opinionated, yes, like Django. It's highly modular, as you just saw. It's, it does central dependency sharing, which is exactly what we want. So what you can do is load specific versions of React, Paragon, whatever, in the, in the central shell application. And then the pilots take advantage of that without having to reload the same, uh, the same or different versions of the, of the libraries. It works with Webpack. This is what, you know, we use Webpack for everything, basically, for in our front end. It does global state management. This is, this is something that the other frameworks don't do necessarily. And this means that there's going to be a new way of communicating between MFVs if we want to use it. It's just a possibility. Uh, it means that this container application can hold state and share it between MFVs if it becomes necessary without us having to reinvent a wheel. And it does independent development and deployment, but this is, you know, a, if you're going to do any kind of federated micro front end uh, development, you're going to need some independence. So we keep some independence, we lose some independence. Can we actually use it in OpenEdX? Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, we've already experimenting with uh, the account MFE. Um, and I'm just going to show a few things that, for those of you that know, this is, this is the package.json on a shell application where you load as dependencies, for instance, the branding package. This is the, the way you're supposed to do theming nowadays with MFEs. Uh, Front-end platform, Paragon, the Pyro-based components, and of course, React. 
And in the pilot, or the MFE, you load these uh, under certain constraints, if you want, but as peer dependencies, right? You're not concerning yourself with loading, uh, or <laughs> in other words, you're not telling the user's browser to reload them if they're already loaded at, at runtime. Um, and if you're curious, in the MFE itself, you're going to have a pilot.jsx or whatever name .jsx you want. And this is, this is basically a manifest of what the MFE does for the benefit of the shell application. So the account MFE has an account settings page and an ID verification page. And you register these with the Pyro API so it can uh, later be routed to. Okay? So this is how the writing works routing works. Uh, you can have additional dependencies, configuration. So this is Pyro's manifest. Um, and this opens, opens our architecture up to cool things, such as this is something Pyro supports. You can have a central registry of pilots uh, that gets queried at runtime by the browser to see which MFEs it can load, for example. And it, uh, we're not necessarily going to be using this for OpenEdX. But if and when we do, it, it makes for an interesting set of uh, extensibility opportunities. Right? Uh, let's say uh, you set up your own registry as, a, as an operator with your own set of MFEs, uh, which you can switch dynamically at any time. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that might have some drawbacks. So we're not sure we're actually going to use that. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> timeline. I still have like seven. Uh, yeah. Uh, so seriously, this time, uh, <laughs> we want to leverage ourselves, basically the community, based of the, on the findings of an, a future accepted OEP. I'm going to link to it so you can go in and comment if you want. Funded by Tcro and possibly other organizations uh, to the extent that they can. But what, I, what I'm trying to say here, we're going to put our money where our mouth is uh, for this one. What? Oh, that's right. I wrote these slides. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Good point. By Axum Collaborative. <laughs> um, to migrate all the Tudor-supported LMS domain MFEs by the end of the year, okay? And bonus points if we finish replatforming the rest of the LMS uh, domain into this architecture as well. Now, this is very, very ambitious. Uh, so what I'm, I'm going to need uh, uh, people's help here, right? Uh, we're going to pay for it. <laughs> To, this, to the extent we can, but we don't have enough hands to do it ourselves. It's just me and Brian <laughs> at Axum. Uh, but we, the idea is, basically, we're going to farm out MFEs to different organizations and hopefully have this work in parallel once the actual specification is done. Right? So I expect to have like Raccoon Gang, OpenCraft, working on different parts of the code base. Some will be porting the uh, monolith into this new architecture. Uh, maybe 2U two, two will pitch in. Maybe uh, Adam will start porting his enterprise MFEs. Uh, Adam's going to be in all of these conversations because <laughs> he's going to want to be able to compose the LMS MFEs into the enterprise and vice versa. Vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. And this is the OAP. I'm going to leave this up. Uh, last slide is questions. I'm going to leave this up if you're curious uh, to go in and check it out. It's going to be updated very frequently moving forward as we're already in proof of concept stage. But the details and the motivation and a lot of what I put in here is done more verbosely in there. Okay? So the, uh, you basically don't need the slides of this talk. You only need that OEP for the future. <laughs> Uh, questions? I know it's a lot to take in, but... Gassan. Yeah. 
do you think maybe like maybe not now but in the longer vision do you think x blocks would be incorporated somehow as a component which one x blocks because x blocks know, yeah as a component great question i3 yeah so <laughs> I mentioned the LMS domain and studio and uh, enterprise and migrating the rest of the Django rendered code into MFEs, right? Um, none of this, none of this plan takes into account X blocks yet, right? That's uh, when we finish replatforming all the Mako rendered stuff, we're still going to have X blocks and those are rendered by Django <laughs> or by a runtime, it's just that the only runtime that actually works is the OpenEdX Django application. Um, so a little more detail for those that don't have a context on this. X blocks are basically all the little uh, blocks of learning content that you get to create when you go into Studio. So you select, I want an HTML block, I want a problem block. Those are X blocks. Um, and the thing with Xbox is they're very, very flexible. So you can stick any old HTML you want in there. Uh, and it's going to be pretty hard to make a similar system that doesn't get uh, rendered server side the way this does. And we don't yet have a plan to tackle that. So, yeah. We, hopefully, we will eventually. Anything else? Did you yeah, so I had a question about um, communication with existing MFE developers. So you're going to, we are going to add a lot of um, synchroniza synchronization, a lot of, um, the, the MFEs will be bounded together. So I expect that um, MFE developers will have to talk to each other again. Yes. Uh, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's a social issue. Um, yes. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Is that, are you done? Um, uh, do you expect some difficulty here? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see David uh, uh, here, uh, but I don't know if I made it clear, but like the main reason MFEs were chosen was precisely so teams didn't have to go and talk to each other to make things happen. Uh, but the truth of it is, uh, there's a team called, called Fed-Bomb at to you. Yeah, that bomb, the ball of mud team. What they do is, poor fellows, I work with them a lot. <laughs> what they do is, uh, each MFE has a different React version or a different whatever. A security issue comes up and you have to upgrade React across all MFEs. Right? So no teams talk to each other. How do you do it? You call FedBomb, and FedBomb goes into each repository and upgrades React accordingly. That's like their whole job. That's all they do all day long. Uh, uh, upgrade library versions across MFEs. So they're a, a proxy for uh, inter-team communication. Right? Does it work very well? I don't think so. so you're, you're in practice, you already have a contract. It's just, it's just that it's humans enforcing it manually, right? Whereas if we do something like this and if we do it right, uh, it's not going to be easy necessarily. For instance, Paragon. Uh, Paragon moves fast. New components get implemented all the time. Uh, if we share a common version between all MFEs, how do you make it so it's not impossible to upgrade it? or not even impossible, you have to make it pretty easy to upgrade Paragon, right? So you have the MFE teams have to talk to the Paragon team to make sure that a certain range of versions doesn't break uh, their, their MFEs when it gets upgraded, right? So there's gonna have to be communication. So to answer your question, it's gonna be hard, but there's gonna have to be communication again. Uh, Hopefully, it's done in, in a way that uh, is not as friction-inducing as it was in the past. So we maintain some independence, but independence within constraints of Paragon versions and so on and so forth. So that, let's say, the shell team 
can upgrade React and not have all the MFEs break, but the MFEs themselves don't need to be modified, so you upgrade the React version. Right? Does this make sense in theory? <laughs> I know, in theory, I know. This is still theory, pretty much. Uh, I fully expect uh, the plan to suffer changes as we go along this next year. Um, we're going to start with the account MFE, then front end app learning, profile, so on and so forth. I'm sure we're going to hit the situation where, oops, this is not going to work for discussions. What do we do? Uh, or it's not going to work for Paragon the way we, we, right? It might require a special version of Paragon in the meantime. But, which is why I'm glad Adam is here. Uh, anyway, yeah. Good question, though. Uh, we we'll have time for one more question. Okay. Oh, sure. mine, is, mine is really quick and not really a question. I just want to say I'm super excited about this and about the Xblocks thing. Um, they're kind of in the similar state where Xblocks have different dependencies that need to be loaded and they're visually inconsistent and yeah, it's just kind of a microcosm of that. And if anyone is interested in working on that, it's, a, it's long been a passion of mine that I've never really had time to get to, but I'd love to talk about it. With anyone. <laughs> have time for boffs still? <laughs> Tomorrow working group? <laughs> uh, yeah, Braden has a very good point. One more. Go ahead. <laughs> So you said end of 2023 in front of the camera? <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, so you, can, you can put on a dunce hat uh, on my hat next conference if I don't make <laughs> So December 9th, 6th is, is Q. Oh, <laughs> OK. <It's Q> <laughs> December 9th is the actual release, right? Uh, yeah. So it's not going to make it into Q. OK. But R? The idea is to, for it to get it into R. Do we have a name for R yet? Regis. <laughs> it's going to be the Regis release. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll, we don't have more time, right? Uh, I'll be around if you have questions about how this might or will work. Thank you very much. <laughs>